Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Matt DeLaCluse. I'm General Manager of RACO Rents. I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for our webinar on light and lighting measurement for the EHS professional. Our presenter today is Dr. William Mills of Northern Illinois University. In this 45-minute webinar, he will cover the following. Understanding visible light units, measurement parameters, lighting wavelengths, different lighting technologies, effects of light on physiology and psychology, vision types, ergonomics, and circadian rhythms, lighting issues in the workplace, basic safety, flicker and glare, productivity, shift work, and fatigue, uh, management concerns in lighting, energy usage, sustainability, environmental light pollution, lighting-related EHS solutions, from measurement to fixtures and system design. And then we'll ask, uh, we'll answer your questions at the end. Dr. Mills has more than 30 years of experience in environmental health and safety, chemical process, and advanced technologies issues. He has worked nationally and internationally for the private sector, government agencies, and academic institutions. Dr. Mills has been focusing on EHS related lighting issues since 2002. His research has included the development and use of sector technologies for industrial hygiene, energy efficiency, and human factors purposes. Dr. Mills holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Trent University with a minor in environmental and resource science, an MS in chemistry from McMaster University, and a PhD in environmental and occupational health sciences from the University of Illinois Chicago, with a specialization in air quality, industrial hygiene, environmental chemistry, and toxicology. He currently serves as assistant professor of environmental health and safety in Northern Illinois University's industrial management technology program. We welcome Dr. Mills as our featured speaker and thank him for sharing his expertise. Now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Mills. Welcome. Thank you very much, Matt. So without further ado, I'm going to proceed here. Uh, my email address, which is probably the best way to get hold of me, is shown here. Uh, I will be providing a copy of the slides to RACO that you can request. They're, they will not post them, but they will send them to you if you email them afterwards to request them. So wh why are we talking about light? Well, if you're in most, I think every place in the U.S. right now would, would have sunlight, daylight outside which should be like this situation here. I guess the first thing I should all say is I'm not making any representations that the PPE and safety equipment that people have on is the, is the proper one. For example, here, I'm surprised they don't have a safety glass on that. But if you have a typical sort of industrial warehouse type of thing, maybe outdoor at a construction site during the day, road construction we've seen. And another place where you see more and more lighting is, for example, on a sports arena here soccer, baseball, football, et cetera. I need to start off since we are a state university to, to mention that there are any um, specific technology or company names is really for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered to cons constitute endorsement. I also want to acknowledge uh, my co-Beam Lab co-founder, Dr. Kevin Martin, and two of our graduate students whose research you'll see displayed Mr. Justin Cathy and Joshua Bobka and this work would not have been possible without the uh, you'll see how many instruments that we have and th these have all been funded by the Northern University Northern Illinois University Department of Technology part of the College of Engineering and Engineering Technology so in terms of what we're going to cover Matt covered a uh, summary of these this is sort of the different uh, sections that I've broken it down to. So let's go back to the electromagnetic spectrum 101. Electromagnetic spectrum ranging from very, very short, 10 to the minus 12 nanometers to well over a kilometer in length. The range down here is very, uh, shorter wavelengths are very energetic. We usually consider the visible light to be approximately 400 to 700 nanometers and again, the shorter wavelengths getting into the ultraviolet is much more energetic, and we will uh, be showing you some examples of that. So we 
we're going basically from purple, which is at the very short end, up to red, which is at the very long end on here. There will not be a quiz though on, on exactly which wavelengths. You don't have to remember that. It's useful to go over a term called spectral power distribution. And what that is is essentially a plot of the intensity versus the wavelength. And there's a number of various light sources I want to show you. If you look at daylight, it's essentially a pretty flat spectral power distribution. The classic Edison tungsten filament incandescent light bulb, and you, you'll see here that most of the wave, most of the energy and the light that's in there is in the yellow to red wavelengths. Your typical fluorescent bulb, this triplet here is very typical. This is from mercury fluorescence. Uh, we have the halogen light bulbs. And then what's come on more and more in later, the last uh, decade or so are light emitting diodes. And here's what they call a cool white LED versus a warm white LED. And you'll see that there's still a blue peak in both, but the relative intensity of that changes. And that's an important factor one I'm going to be talking about. So in order to talk about this properly, you really need to understand there are a number of different um, lighting units. The base system international or SI unit is a candela. And uh, candela is a base, basically 1 over 633 watts per steradian. So there's an homage to pi right there into stradians. The, the main term that you'll see used in most lighting measurements, uh, if you go into a hardware store and you buy a light bulb, that light bulb is usually given in terms of lumens. A lumen is equal to one candela per steradian. When you're talking about measurements in a, light, in a workplace where people use what they call light meters, that's usually actually measuring illuminance, which is the SI unit for that is lux. That's a derived unit. It's a lumens per meter squared. The more, uh, the imperial unit for that is one, one foot candle. A foot candle is equal to 10.76 lux. Other terms you'll run into is lumen maintenance. That's, that's how well or how flat or how long the light fixture can last before it loses 50% or so of, of the light uh, intensity. The other, another term we'll talk about is efficacy. And what we mean there is how many lumens per watt we get. So if we put X watts in, how many lumens do we get out? CCT, color correlated temperature, is a measure of the light source color uh, compared to a heated black body radiator. So think about a, a blacksmith with horseshoes. If you take a horseshoe just at room temperature and you put it in there, it'll start getting orange and then it'll get red hot and then it'll get even hotter, it goes to white hot. So uh, we'll show you some slides on how that, got, that comes out. Color rendering index or CRI is basically how well uh, a light source shows an object's color. I think we've all seen that, uh, how you almost like mood lighting or how, how different lighting can affect what things you can see. And I've already talked about the spectral power distribution or SPD. So in lighting terminology, we have there's a relationship between the CCC and then the CIE is Committee International, uh, I think it says, it's the International Committee of Responsible for Illumination Standards. And in 1931, they came up with what's called this color space. And what's important on here is this is essentially what I talked about, the black body uh, radiator, this black line. Hopefully people can see this mouth. And what you'll see is a line that's along here that correlates with certain temperatures of a black body radiator. And remember I said that you see the, the horseshoe goes to like a orange and then a red, more of a red hot. And then as it gets up here, you're getting into almost white hot. What you'll also see, though, is for equivalent uh, color correlated temperature, you can have quite large lines. So what this means, this could almost be uh, violet, almost up into to turquoise, it looks like, uh, for 10,000 Kelvin. And then 
at 3,000 Kelvin, it's uh, like almost orange up into yellow, maybe even a little bit of green. So uh, these are important. Another thing that's happened here, though, with LEDs, and uh, I talk about this, with the, one of the things to think about is uh, automobile headlights now at night. Part of the issue that's going on, there, those they have a much higher CCT than the old incandescent lamps did, which were more down around the 3,000 or less. Now a lot of the uh, LED headlights are up 5,500 to 7,000 Kelvin, and this is what they would look like to you. Another thing that you need to remember is what's called the luminous efficiency function. And these are, there's two major types of vision. One that's related to what we call photopic or V lambda, which essentially is what takes place under daylight. And then secondly, we have what's called scotopic or V prime lambda, which is a type of vision that's more related to starlight. Now, what that relates to is what part of the eye, and I'll be talking about eye physiology shortly. Essentially, photopic vision is using your cones, and that's this red line along here. It's, it's got a maximum sensitivity at around 555 nanometers, which is in the yellow-green area. Whereas scotopic vi vision is utilizing more of the rods, and that's sort of a bl considered blue-green around about 505 nanometers. So this is essentially getting into what would be more your, your night vision, and then this is your vision in the daytime where you get more color in that as well. So those metrics, some of those metrics I've just gone through, like lux, and we talked about the uh, lux can be either photopic lux or scotopic lux. So, and then lumens, if you remember that slide where I showed you the CCT and the chromaticity diagram there with the black body array, array uh, your appearance for the lumens can also change depending on the spectral power distribution of the light. And again, the illuminance, remember I talked about scotopic or photopic, this the appearance of, of the light and how much lumens in, in either scotopic or photopic is going to depend on the spectral power distribution. I'll be giving you some examples of that. I also talked about the luminous efficacy, which it comes down to lumens per watt. One of the major issues here is going to be the directionality of the lumens. And I'll give you an example over here. Uh, one of the problems with on the right in this outdoor, this is uh, so sodium, high pressure sodium lamps. And what you'll see is uh, directly down from the light fixture is much, much brighter than over to the over to the side of here. What that means is that the coverage efficiency as well as power efficiency is uh, diminished Ver versus over here where we have LED lighting, which is much more even and therefore we're able to have a lumens per watt that's gonna be uh, less. Now, the other thing that's going on is the uh, sodium vapor is much more photopic vision, uh, whereas the, uh, the LED lighting over here is, is utilizing more scotopic vision, and we'll talk about that shortly too. So where we utilize lighting, and I, light and lighting, primarily, and in, in, I'm going to talk about indoor mostly here, is means of egress. First of all, how do you get out of a building? Can you see the exits? Can you see that the exits are, are clear? If you're in a warehouse or an industrial facility, can you walk the aisles uh, and, and see if there's anything in your way? Is there, uh, we were, Matt and I were out there earlier, that we had, and they had the ice, you know, can you see ice or oil spill or that? Can you see if there's any obstructions that might result in you tripping over them and falls? So, the, you know, is there enough that I can walk around safely and see what I'm doing? We also worry about productivity. Is there enough lighting to do the specific tasks that I'm going to? Some tasks don't need that much lighting. If I'm just walking around in a warehouse, I don't need as much lighting as when I'm working on a printed circuit board, maybe uh, make putting a chip in. If you're taking photographs, 
uh, as part of your work. You know, the lighting's going to be important. But another one I want to bring out, and I've already alluded to it, what about when we're driving at night? You know, you still need light there. If that part of your job involves moving things around at night, you're going to, you're going to need some sort of lighting, either headlights or uh, area lighting. <coughs> another consideration that a lot of people seem to be surprised at is, is energy efficiency. Lighting is actually the third largest energy use in commercial buildings in the US according to the US energy information here. You can see it's about, in 2012, was about 10% of the overall energy used in commercial buildings. So there's some opportunities there for energy efficiency. So let's go back to basic physiology of the human eye. Most people are aware of the rods and the cones. So rods are essentially black and white vision and there's a large number of them, about 120 million, that are spread fairly evenly over the retina. Uh, one of the things you'll see is that this is what allows peripheral vision. And this is one of the things you talk about in night vision. They say, you know, look at out the side of your eye. Don't look at something directly on. That's to make use of all the the equal density of the, the uh, rods outside of the fovea, which is the central point. Uh, the rods operate in, in lower light levels than cones. Uh, and then when we get daylight and in high intensities, we move into where we use cone vision. There's much fewer of these, uh, about 8 million of them, and in the fovea, which is this central area here of the, of the eye. There's three major types, what we call long, medium, and short wavelength. And the cones are responsible for your visual acuity. That's what allows you to see very, very fine details. But they require much higher light levels to work approximately three times higher uh, than the rods in order to work. What most people have not seen, and I understand Matt did biology, and they probably didn't cover it in his biology class they did, is there, it turns out there's a third set of photo reset of non-vision photosensitive cells in, in that are called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or IPRGC, say that three times in the morning, uh, that were first noticed in mammalian systems actually as far back in the 1920s in rats and all that, but uh, really the pioneering work was by a gentleman named Burson from Brown University, published a paper in 2002. And what the key finding here is the IPRGCs affect circadian rhythms, but they also have an influence on pupillary reflex, and that's what's really going on as part of the people's aversion to those high-powered LED lights at night. Let's see here, we should, there should be, there's a fly in, maybe it goes here. Okay, that paper that I told you about in 2002 has been cited 1,396 times as of yesterday. That That is a huge number of sites in uh, scientific literature, it, I, I generally consider anything that's been cited more than 100 times is probably somewhat significant. So uh, this this was groundbreaking work. Uh, you'll see early, later, I'll talk a bit about it, but I would not be surprised if at some point in the future this work is in discovering how these IPRGCs work would get a Nobel Prize. The, this is the mechanism, just so you, I'm not just doing speculation here, uh, of how the suprachiasmatic nucleus works. And essentially what it's an evolutionary biology and what goes on is under low light conditions at night, that's seen in the optic chiasm in the eye, that's where that optical nerve go back to the brain, that results in the, the SCN being stimulated, which in turn stimulates the pineal gland to produce melatonin, which enhances the production of serotonin which results in a brain activity falling, which results in, in you getting sleep. The IPRGC peak sensitivity, and remember this, this is important, about 480 to 490 nanometers. I've seen a couple different articles disputing which wavelength it actually is, but I'll say 480 to 490 is where its peak sensitivity is. But it turns out the, so essentially if it gets light, it shuts this, this uh, 
process down here and you, and you basically don't fall asleep or you don't sleep as well. What they've found is from neuroimaging studies, the blocking of this pathway is dependent on the wavelength of light. So obviously if something is blue light, that's a peak sensitivity. But it also turns out it's, it depends on the duration of the light exposure and the intensity of the light exposure. And remember, intensity is if we're doing the illumination, illuminance is measured in lux. All of these lead to a depression in this SCN simulation, which results in in uh, not in either falling asleep later, but also it turns out results in your sleep not being as good quality either. And just so people, you know, the circadian rhythm and all that, uh, how well we know it, uh, it's been recognized as being significant. It got to know the recognition of the molecular mechanisms received, uh, this is with the clock gene and that, received a Nobel Prize in October 2017. So this is not speculative scientist, science going on here. It's very well established at this point. Uh, what this results in, if you think about it, you don't get enough sleep or you don't get proper sleep, that leads to fatigue. And on the left here, I want people to look at this. On the y-axis, or the x-axis, sorry, here is, is how long somebody's been awake. And on the x-axis is a relative performance score. The bottom one, B, is actually comparing blood alcohol concentration with performance on that same relative performance score. You'll see the slopes are pretty equal. And around 0.94, if, if we go 0.08, which in Illinois is uh, legally impaired, we're at about 0.94. Okay, 0.94 on the performance scale is here after about 22 hours awake. You're basically drunk. And uh, you can also, another way of showing this or of seeing this here is this graph here, which essentially shows how it follows the pattern of the day. So the reason it starts going up here, that's the sunlight coming up next day, which gives you a bit of, of attention stimulation. But essentially as nighttime comes on, your relative performance goes down. This is gonna be around two or three o'clock in the morning probably for most people. So essentially somebody who's out there driving fatigued or working fatigued is working impaired. In addition, the use of shift work. So I talked about working at night and all that, where maybe you disrupt your circadian rhythm. So uh, that International Agency for Research in Cancer in 2007 classified this as probably carcinogenic to humans, which is group 2A. And it's believed to be disruption of the circadian system by exposure to light at night. So this is putting it in, in uh, uh, I looked up the group 2A, there's, probably a close to 100 different chemicals in there. So this is like a exposure of light at night or shift work can be considered ex equivalent to possible exposure to certain chemicals that most of us would be trying to keep the workers safe from. In addition, the American Medical Association 2012 has posted a, a policy statement on the adverse health effects of nighttime lighting. And this is the concern about the 24-7 and the more and more electronic devices and that at night. Another thing that most people don't think about on light, but goes back to my point earlier about the uh, increasing use of, of cool uh, temperature LED headlights. That's getting into the blue region here. And there are known, uh, again, that's lower energy or lower wavelengths is higher energy. And there are things like cataracts and uh, impairment of the, of the retina and that that come into place. And there are optical exposure hazards. And there's actually occupational exposure limits in that for blue lighting. And you can see here, there's the green, two greens here are different types of LED. I showed you what we considered a warm LED and a cool LED. And you can see, especially the cool LED, how much of its energy is in this blue light region. So. Uh, this can lead to cataracts, uh, it can lead to retinal damage and that. Now, it's also dependent on the, on the intensity of it. So what you'll find is some lighting that's out there 
depending on how much lumens its rating is, the same version will not have a warning, but a higher lumens of that same light, say on this green one here, would have a blue light optical hazard rating and warning on when, when you buy it. So you need to be aware of, of the optical uh, hazard from blue light as well. Another emerging issue related to light is environmental light pollution. And these are, this is the evolution of the uh, light uh, seen, seen from space by a satellite over the, the continental United States into this one here should be the 1990s. And uh, I'm in Chicago, and it's pretty much all red around here now. The reason we worry about light pollution includes things such as reduced or little night sky visibility. So think about if you're trying to do scientific research, so telescopes and that. Another thing we're seeing is uh, the nitrogen oxide radical, which is an essential radical, uh, essential part of the detoxification or degradation of things like volatile organics and that in, in the air that takes place, needs almost complete darkness to work through. When you start getting light, that radical disappears and that, that's, there's evidence that that's leading to increased air pollution in cities. We are finding in cities where we're, where we're seeing the biggest problem with uh, light pollution is uh, disruption of sleep cycles. And, and it's, there is evidence of increased rates of cancer, depression, and obesity that are all related to light exposure as well in, in urban areas. I wouldn't say it's solely because of this, but it's certainly associated with it. And there's a, a biological plausibility that certainly I would think uh, we need to at least be cautious about. Clearly, there's been a number of review papers that uh, light pollution can also disrupt biological processes in flora and fauna, uh, the behavior of animals, uh, foraging areas for the animals, breeding cycles of animals, and just generalized stress. Uh, when you look at stress hormones, things like cortisol and that in animals in more urban areas or areas where there's more lighting. Uh, the other thing, if you think about it, all that light that's going up into space is not really going where it, where it needs to be. So that means we're wasting a lot of money and energy. One of the things we need to be doing a better job of, in my mind, going forward is going to be just simple lighting fixture and luminaire design so that we're more like this, so that you can still have the darkness up here. That would result in most of the things I've talked about uh, being less of concern. I also want to talk right now about the different types of lighting. Uh, very, very briefly, I showed you an example of an incandescent lighting. A lot of plants still probably have metal halide or high pressure sodium, but we're moving away from that. A lot of indoor environments have fluorescence, both compact or linear. Induction lighting is more specialized, and I think in most cases, people are going to be jumping over that rate to lighting meaning diode, which is by far the largest growing sector of uh, lighting these days for, for a number of, of reasons that we'll talk about here. First thing I want you to see is, remember we talked about lumens versus watts? You can see here that uh, the efficacy is going to be five to almost 10 times more versus incandescence, about 10 times more that we can achieve now. Another thing that, or another reason we're going to LEDs, so there's energy efficiency, but the other thing is they're much longer life, lifestyle, or uh, much longer time span where they're, they're, they maintain their rate of lumen. So you can see here, you're getting out to 50,000 hours on a high power LED with less than 70%, uh, well, still with 70%. If you think about uh, areas where you may have high bay or where you, you, you cannot easily access a light, being able to go essentially probably, in this case, 10 times longer than many other types of lighting certainly has its list of advantages. A bunch, so lighting, if I was summarizing all the lighting issues up that we've talked about, ergonomics and human factors, uh, things like where we want to do, we might want to have task lighting for both our productivity. There's also, in the same way lighting can diminish your ability to sleep. You can also use lighting in some circumstances to increase your tenderness and cognitive skills. Uh, but the other one, side of that is going to be your circadian rhythm disruption, with, which has uh, effects on alertness, uh, fatigue level, and, and 
worker performance. Physiological issues you need to be concerned with include things like flicker, glare, and optical safety, which I talked about. That's essentially the blue blue light. Uh, flicker is something that's a special concern uh, that was seen more with fluorescence. But if you think about the strobe effect and all that, that uh, migraines, epileptic, there's some people who are uh, really affected by flicker. I talked at the very beginning about general safety, such things such as means of egress, avoiding slips and falls, uh, things like energy efficiency, which we just went over, and then ease of maintenance. And then another thing that which we're going to come to now is going to be talked about lighting measurements. So tying this all together, we basically have a triangle here that's a look at energy use, psychological impact, and then physiological effects that the environmental health and safety professional that's out there is, if they aren't already dealing with it, they're probably going to be dealing with it, or they need to be aware of it to start dealing with it. There are some recommendations for uh, lighting levels that have been published. Uh, the Illumination, uh, Illuminating Engineering Society is one of the major ones. Surprisingly, OSHA really only has two regulations that that even really mention any sort of lighting the, the construction one uh, 19, 29 CFR 1926 and the shipyard 29 CFR 1915 do have some lighting measurements that are in in the range of around here and, and here in terms of the recommended levels what I do want to note is on that prior side these are all po topic foot candles, and remember, uh, one foot candle is about 10 lux. So the types of instrumentation, these are uh, some of the instruments that we have in our lab at Northern Illinois University. Uh, the top type are what we call photometers. These give you essentially an integrated photopic lux measurement. And what most of them are characterized by is <coughs> a sensor head, and then most of the time now there'll be digital displays here. Uh, so, that, and then I, I can't even remember what all of them are. I know this is an ideal instrument. This is SPUR. Uh, this is CE. So these these first four, first five, sorry, and this is a hobo, which is a data logger with a light sensor. Um, this is a logging data. Uh, it, it can store up a thousand light measurements. These are what we call simple photometer. They simply give you a photopic lux reading. This is a combined scotopic photopic lux. It has two different sensors, one that gives you scotopic and one that gives you photopic lux, and it'll give you both numbers on here. Down below, we have what are called spectrometers, and, and the difference here is spectrometers will, will give me spectral power distributions. They will also give me, in most cases, photopic lux, and in some cases, scotopic lux, and based on the spectral power distribution, I can actually calculate both my scotopic and photopic uh, luxes and a ratio. You can see for scale here, this is a, a quarter. This is a gigahertz uh, BTS 256E. This is a Upertech MK350D. This is an Asense Tech uh, lighting passport. This is an Upertech uh, MF250N, which has built in flicker reading. This is an Ocean Optics uh, STS Viz. Hooked up to, since it's Pi Day, a Raspberry Pi microcomputer. Uh, this is a Pasco fiber optic spectrometer. Both these are fiber optics. And then we have a Nano Lambda uh, spectrometer head. And I'll talk about this later. This is a sensor array that we've built here for testing at Northern Illinois University. So utilizing these types of measurements, this is a gigahertz underneath a, a LED light bulb. And we're measuring at 12 inches. And I'm going to zero. So this is a sensor. I've got it basically directly right under. And you can see here that, I, that I'm actually measuring, in the pho, terms of photopic lux, about, 20, about 2,500 photopic lux and about 2,900 scotopic lux. And my scotopic photopic ratio is about 1.2. If I tilt that meter away now, you'll see that uh, the 2,900 is now down around 2,100, and the, the 2,200, whatever, is down to 1,700. Notice that my scotopic photopic lux has not changed, though, and that's 
typical. What this does tell you though is your orientation of your light sensor or your light meter sensor to the light source you're we're concerned about is important. Uh, and so you you can have two people measure and get slightly different things because of how they're, or slightly different numbers based on how they're, they are measuring it. So consideration when you're measuring it, the orientation I've already talked about. Uh, lighting levels, at lower light levels, depending on the sensitivity of your meter, you may have to change your integration time in order to get enough sensitivity. The distance from lighting or windows, what your background might be uh, in terms of if you're looking at spectral power distribution, if you've got a mixture of, for example, LED and compact fluorescent bulbs. Accessibility to make the lighting measurements uh, at where people are working, uh, your number of sampling locations. If you're only going to do one or two sampling locations, maybe you don't need data logging. But if you're going to be doing hundreds of sampling locations, you probably want to have some sort of data logging and whether you need to get the spectral power distribution or not. For those who are interested further, there is an article that Dr. Martin and I published last summer that's available. It's an open access, if, and the reference for it is here, and I've also provided at the end of the document a list of references. So th what I have here, and one of the things that LED is more unique about is the ability to do what they call tunable. That means I can change the spectrum. This is the exact same lighting fixture. It's a desk lamp that we have switched it. Uh, the blue is what we would call a cool or a higher CCT. Notice how much this blue is and, and that the area in, on the warmer portion is lower. If I make it warmer, I've increased the red orange region and reduced the blue region, okay? And this is again the wavelengths. And in this case, I'm doing I'm showing you 380 to 730. And then this is just a relative intensity. Now, in the next slide, I've actually taken that same that same light fixture as both what we call dimmable tunable. And so what I've done here is I've left the spectrum the same. It's at a 5900 Kelvin CCT. But what I've changed now is I've dimmed it, and I've got various lighting levels. At the lowest lighting, very low intensity, I'm only consuming about 1.8 watts, all the way up to lighting level five, where now I've, so it's a factor of four almost, uh, more more wattage. And you can see here, actually on the scotopic, it's almost a factor of 10 more on the photopic lux that's out there. Notice one thing that's not changing very much is the scotopic photopic ratio. That's be essentially, if you want, it would be like the ratio from about five, probably about 525 and lower. So the integration underneath here versus the area up above that. So you can see here, because of this intense blue relative to here, that the scotopic photopic ratio is, um, is above two. Got another set of data, another scenario here, which is a, a cool, it's a Osram LED spectral power distribution, what we call number one. With 6,500 Kelvin, I'm not surprised at all to see that big a blue peak. Remember I talked about the IPRGCs, 480 nanometers is, it, is its uh, maximum uh, its sensitivity. So we're getting in here. This is just a comparison of a variety of different photometers and a spectrometer. What this tells you is, that from a photopic lux point of view, uh, uh, a relatively inexpensive photometer and a spectrometer and a more expensive spectrometer are fairly equivalent under this spectrum condition. So that that's good news, but there's a whole bunch of things that a, that a photopic spectrometer is not getting, and we're we went into this here. So we this is with three different spectrometers. This was interesting to us, but what we, we are doing further investigation, what we found out is this is actually more a function of integration time. And you'll see if we plot this on a, uh, so this is absolute intensity, sorry, which is a watts per meter squared. And spectrometry is one that was higher, but the other spectrometers are pretty close and they're in line or photopic lux with, with the basic spectrometer from two or three slides earlier. 
If we take the spectrometers and measure what we call relative, so we just adjust the, the peak equal to one, they're much closer together, they're very tight. That's one of the things that said to us, hey, there's something else going on here. They're seeing pretty much the same thing. So it, it turns out it's, it's more about how they're, they're uh, processing the signal than, than about the actual accuracy of the detector. So, so summing up what I thought might be helpful, if you're, if you're going out there, I showed you what, I think I showed you about 10 to 15 different types of instruments. If you're going to go out and you want to look at uh, purchasing or renting some instruments, what do you want to look at? I've made up a list here. Uh, I think where are you going to use it, indoor, outdoor? Uh, are you going to compare it to any lighting standards? Which, are you, do you need to get the spectral range? Do you need to get spectral power distribution? What the resolution is in terms of, can you do with 10 or 20 nanometers, or do you need one nanometer? Uh, sensitivity is how low can you measure and under what lighting condition? Power consumption is an, an issue that's related somewhat to portability, but also whether you, know, you have to have plugged in, et cetera. If you're going to do a spectrometer, um, it's much easier to get low-cost spectrometers if they're doing a relative spectral power distribution than, than absolute. And under certain circumstances, that may be okay. Portability, you know, where, are you, where are you going to take it? What are you going to do with the data? How much data are you going to produce? Obviously, if you're doing something that's one nanometer resolution and you're measuring from 400 to 700 nanometers, that means you're, you're producing 300 data points for each measurement. That means you can you can start producing some pretty large amounts of data. You need to have a plan for how you're going to manage that. Uh, compatibility with your current data system or other instruments you might have, and comparability if you're changing um, uh, from a photometer to a spectrometer or from one uh, type of one type of instrument or one manufacturer to another. And finally, cost can be an issue, but there are many ways, as with a lot of things in industrial hygiene, of determining what's the cost. I would caution people, don't just go by the purchase cost. Uh, there may be some significant advantage by spending a little bit more to avoid cost down the line. Another thing that goes back to the scotopic photopic ratio and is this concept of uh, visu visually effective lumens. What work done by the Department of Energy, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, showed that in addition to their uh, non-vision effects, there is a vision-related effect from the IPRGCs and scotopic vision that results in people being able to see better than what the actual photopic lux shows. And that's this, essentially what this is saying is that higher scotopic photopic ratios, in other words, more in the blue, or, or a green region of the spectrum when they have more of that, that they get an, an increase in what they can eat actually uh, the visually effective lumens. And in other words, you're able to see better than what the photopic lux would actually lead you to believe. And this is when you just have ambient lighting. So if you think about a warehouse, if you switch in a warehouse to, where you don't need extreme visual acuity, you, you can actually go to a higher scotopic photopic ratio, which means you're using more vision with your rods, and you would you would be able to to see just as well in terms of na navigating around than if it was all photopic. When you have task lighting, it's even better. You you can get an even better, uh, uh, even higher. It's, it's now to the power of 0.1 for the scotopic photopic ratio. And this is essentially a combination of color, but also how spectral distribution, power distribution will work into here. So I want to show you some examples of work that we've done to take into consideration uh, the prior stuff on lighting. So one of the things that my colleague and I are interested in is building management systems where we're taking the, essentially that tri triangle approach and trying to adjust in the workplace you know, so we call this a, this was a senior design project. And what we have is we can adjust the uh, lighting and the ventilation based on occupancy and the time of day. And with we have a, that STS visual spectrometer hooked into Raspberry Pi. 
that will give me both the spectrum and the amount of light in terms of a photopic lighting. I also have sensors for particulates or aerosols, temperature, relative humidity, and CO2. All these feed into my master controller. And uh, for lighting, using smart things, I can adjust my lighting levels and my lighting spectrum. I can also use my uh, indoor air quality ma management to either uh, using here to either make an air conditioning or heating. And, I, and based on CO2 and uh, relative humidity and that, I can also uh, add outdoor air and change my ratio of indoor air recirculation and outdoor air. And the Raspberry Pi is, a, is approximately credit card microcomputer. Uh, so uh, again, my homage, we have three of these in this system. We took, when we took that system and we looked at lighting, if we just use visibly effective lumens, which essentially is going from uh, what I would call photopic vision or photopic light, and we change the spectrum, so we're, we're essentially at the same level in terms of if we use VEL, we've now got a 33% just by changing the spectrum of the light. If I look at light harvesting where I allow outside light to come in and I also make use of the visibly effective lumens, I, I'm getting a total of 74%. If I include light harvesting, I'm getting 45%. So think about this. With a building management system on lighting, I've resulted in for equivalent, same amount of equivalent vision, if you wish, that we've got 74% energy savings from the base level, which is right up here. So basically went from 6.9 to one with, this, with the same perceived lighting level. Another thing we worked on, it sort of came out of the, that building one where we wanted to replace essentially those passive infrared stationary sensors. We designed and a student group built a wearable sensor array. For those who I don't have a quarter, I should have put a quarter in here, but this is essentially the, the same size as a ID badge that is well used. We have a lighting sensor in here that has red, green, blue, and white sensors, an indoor air quality sensor that has CO2 and a VOC sensor. We have a noise sensor and we have an accelerometer. All of these go to a what's called a featherboard, which is has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi capabilities, and it takes the sensor data, it pulls through those one at a time every 30 seconds to a minute, and wirelessly communicates that back. Again, homage to the uh, Pi Day to a, another Raspberry Pi. That Raspberry Pi records the sensor data, and then makes the and that's the same Raspberry Pi that what is in the building management system. We've built four complete systems on this. This case is, is done what they call rapid prototyping. It's simply a three, uh, 3D printer in, in one of our classrooms that we use. And uh, as I said, it's been interfaced with the existing building management system now. <clears throat> the future work we're looking at, I talked about melatonin, the chemical that's actually in the IPRGCs is called um, melan melan mel is called melatonin, but melanopsin. So we call it a melanopsic a melanopic response. You can actually use the relative SPD measurement and the measured photopic lux to calculate how much essentially you're you're interrupting the circadian rhythm. There's another equation put out by uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic. It's called a circadian rhythm stimulation that we can also work with. I showed you that one uh, slide where the one of the spectrometers seemed to give a much larger reading than the others. That, that's an absolute calculation. We're working more on that. That's going to be an interesting paper. We're working right now on the development of a, a low-cost handheld spectrometer, again using a Raspberry Pi, uh, another homage to Pi Day, sorry. And then uh, we are actually looking at that fiber optic, that STS Viz. If you remember, it had the blue fiber optic, where we would essentially attach it to uh, an a, a, a empty set of glass frames and would allow us to get an actual eye exposure for with the spectral power distribution and, and intensity. 
So those are just some of the areas we're working in that are involving lighting with EHS. So with that, and Matt, only five minutes over, sorry. Right, no. uh, thank you for your attention. You can obtain more information on, on our, and contact me or my colleague uh, through our website, which is here. And then finally, I've left people with uh, some selective reading to get you going. If there's only one book you're going to get, this IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society Lighting Handbook, is worth it. It's, it's gone down in cost. It's only about $500 now. It used to be 1000 So uh, with that, I will open up to questions. All right. Let's see what we've got as far as questions. Well, I don't – let's see. I've got one comment. I know I went over a lot of stuff. Uh, I, as I told Matt earlier, I could easily have talked all day. But it, it's better to provoke maybe some, and feel free to challenge me if, if you think you need more information or something, okay? Are the IESNA and light range recommendations They're in? Photopic. The, the, all, all lighting that's out there right now is photopic. The one thing that has happened is there now is a IES TM24-13 that makes use of the what they call EVE, which is essentially a rearranged form of the VEL for, uh, I believe it's P through Y um, situations. So it's considered an alternative uh, and it does allow you to get credit for scotopic lighting, but those tables that I showed you are based on photopic lux only. Okay. Is uh, there a lag time between integration of scotopic vision when absolutely transitioning from a bright environment? So I'm not sure who's out there, maybe has been in the military or that, but in the military, one of the things you remember when we work with night vision, we have a lot of the red lighting. The reason we have the red lighting is that the rods don't see in there. And so what that allows you to do is acclimatize. So I told you and I showed you that the rods are about three to four times more sensitive than the cones to light. And they also get saturated much sooner. That's why uh, when you have night vision, somebody hits you with a flashlight, or you need that acclimatization time. So you can do one of two things. You either need time to adjust or and or you can use more red lighting so that your your rods are fairly well adjusted already. But I would still say, even as soon as you go outside, you're still going to need um, you're still going to need some time for that. All right. So what's that one? How, how low can light? Okay. So the question here was how low can light level go at building entryways and ex, and exterior sidewalks? That's a good question. It's going to be a function of what the hazards are in terms of slip strips and that. Uh, in terms of photopic, what the recommendations are in ISNA are more in three to five lux. Uh, there's some work going on in the agriculture industry, though, that uh, if, you, if you include scotopic, photopic, it, it could be even lower. But the total probably combined scotopic, photopic would still be in the range. How would you measure to prevent IR and UV exposure? Right. Due to so, so that question there is you would need a wider range spectrometer than just it. So that remember I said one of the questions on, on your instrument consideration is what spectral range do you need? If you're just doing visible light effects, you really only need 400 or 380 to 700, 750. If you're worried about UV and, and surgical rooms and places where they're doing uh, UV germicidal, you'll be wanting to include UV. Uh, they're infrared, depending on what you're doing. I mean, uh, the heat lamps, etc. cetera. You, you'll, you will need wider wavelength than just a visible light spectrometer. Uh, Seen LED light meters for sale, any need to buy one? You gotta be very, very careful. Uh, that I, I've got some other work that I didn't show you. Here is uh, what, what people call LED light meters is the Wild West. There is no meaning to this. Uh, they're usually providing a correction factor. And 
If you remember back to the chromaticity diagram where I can show you on the same CCT, I can get a large variation in the color. There, I don't personally think from the data we're, and the data we're shown is that uh, without SPD information, you cannot a priori tell whether that LED light meter is, is proper. You would still need to essentially calibrate or run that LED light meter against a spectrometer. Is there any guidance yeah. on LED exposure in hortic horticultural greenhouse workspaces? Absolutely. I did not include it here because it's a fairly specialized area, but that's another area where I would, you definitely need to have a spectrometer um, for that. And it's not just horticulture like greenhouses. Think about chicken, uh, eggs, eggs, and there's other, other types of agricultural uh, workplace operations where there, and I wouldn't say LED exposure. It's really not about LED exposure. It's about light exposure and different light sources have different spectral power distributions. What are the options for people that respond to the frequency of lighting? I'm not sure if, it, it, do they mean frequency? Because when you have wavelength, the inverse of wavelength is frequency. Or do they, do they mean the frequency of the light spectral power distribution? Or do they mean how often light, lighting is going? Uh, So, and then the next question was, do these lighting levels presented in this table still apply? Well, it's going to depend on the SPD of the LEDs. Those were all photopic. Uh, so you may be able to, you may find that if it is a high scotopic photopic ratio, that in fact a, a photopic lux reading would, you would still consider them too bright for certain conditions. And then uh, assume you have all these for rent. Uh, that's a question more for you. Yeah, we have photometers at this point. We will be adding some of these spectrometers here in the very near future. Uh, one thing I'll say about calibration, I mean, you should always make sure it's calibrated, but our data is clearly showing uh, some of those photometers were had, one was like two, two and a half years since it had been calibrated but kept in the lab, and then the other one was literally brand new, sent to us, uh, we pulled it off the, uh, right out of a warehouse, and they were indistinguishable in performance and less than 1% difference across five readings, That and the 10 readings we got from the two by ANOVA were indistinguishable. So what I recommend people do is buy, we went out, we just bought, and again, not, I won't say who, we bought a LED light bulb, and what we've done is run all of our photometers and spectrometers against those. And at the same, uh, at a common, the same, one thing you got to remember is the distance uh, makes a difference. So we measure all ours at 12 inches and plotted all the stuff. They're all very close. And we're just doing control charting. Before we go to use an instrument, we put the same light bulb in. We measure our voltage with, uh, and watts to make sure that uh, it's still doing the same power. And we just control chart, and if it's not varying, and you can show it's not varying, you may not need to. Most manufacturers say you need it every year. I would say if you've got performance data to show that it hasn't changed, you may be able to go longer. Mm -hmm. If I was doing things, if I had a multiple light meter, so I'd probably still get one light meter done once a year, and, and then I got something to compare to. Okay. Uh, what other devices are you controlling in the building using uh, We We controlled the lighting spectrum and power, so it was dimmable, tunable. We, uh, we, com we controlled whether it was in air conditioning or heating mode or just air circulation mode, because remember, we, we had sensors for particulate CO2 and uh, uh, temperature, and then we also... We could recirculate just solely indoor air, but if, for example, CO, if temperature is fine but CO2 was an issue, we could bring in, we could change the, the amount of out, outdoor air. Same thing if we started having high levels of particulate, we could bring in more outside air to reduce the levels. Oh, the other thing it did have too is we could go to a mode where we could do particulate filtering. If a light survey has been conducted by a photometer and levels were Quite a lot higher than recommended. Could it be harmful to employees exposed? Do you have any 
potential solutions for individuals with sensitivity? That's going to be a question what you mean. If you notice uh, at, at what they said recommended. If you're down in the uh, probably less than 100 lux, uh, I would say there's there's not going to be much of a problem with overexposure. But when you say sensitivity, I mean, I've worked on uh, issues where people get migraines and all that. So there may be where with some people where uh, if you're less than 300, 500 lux, you're probably not if it's photopic, it doesn't have too much in the blue, you're probably not going to have any specific uh, health, physiological health concern, but you might get into things, for example, uh, if it's really heavy in the blue, uh, and that, or if people have migraine sensitivity. So it's a wishy-washy answer there, but it, it just depends. Um, I would say you're getting up 1,000 lux, higher than that, and, that you, and if it's got a lot of blow, you, you might want to start considering about things like sunglasses or, or that, or um, using using lighting that's more directed so it doesn't get into the person's eyes. Okay. Can you comment on low lighting levels at yeah. night as perceived by the aging population? Okay, so I think what that goes to might be visual acuity. If, if you're talking about visual acuity, the there is an issue that as people get older visual acuity goes down and they do need more lighting to perform the same task if and so i'm not sure if they're but if you're talking about uh circadian rhythm disruption i that's not really as much from what i've seen a function of age in other words the iprgc's sensitivity is there i i don't think is an issue there's no doubt teenagers using electronic devices these days. There's been a number of studies now that show electronic device, whether you're young or old, using those with LED screens with the heavy blue component and not even recent research. Blue component, but relatively low. I'm talking less than 10 lux um, that, that that can result, start resulting in a circadian rhythm disruption. You do a survey of a welding facility that works three shifts, 24-7. Do we need different lighting for day than nighttime? And Matt actually has to talk. To it, that, again, that I would want to know what your relative lighting is. The one thing about the relative uh, lighting levels are, including the spectral power distribution, one thing you've got to be concerned about in UV, especially if it's arc, is you're going to have large amounts of ultraviolet. If you're doing um, more of like acetylene, you're going to have a large amount of infrared. So it's not just visible light, it's you. It's more electromagnetic radiation that you would need to take into consideration. What are good resources for those conducting ergonomic assessments to be able to identify and resolve lighting issues for individuals? Uh, I provide you some references on there. If you look at our article in the, or got the handbook, um, uh, when measuring basic light levels of street area lighting, do you measure from the ground or from the eye level? That's a really good question. If you're looking at it for in terms of being able to uh, perceive uh, slip strips and falls, that's going to be where it's the incident light basically at the ground level, so what you can see there. If what you're worrying about, though, is more about circadian rhythm and that or, or glare or flicker, you would want both and uh, you would want sorry at the eye level and my uh, we've got some research that's coming up on this we're 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 looking into what's the effect of like ground level lighting along a light a pathway uh, but that's really a concept if you can keep the lighting low maybe what you do is reduce the you can still see well enough to to, to walk and be safe and not result in the uh, unintended environmental light pollution I love the idea of your wearable sensor. Would like to know if this has been commercialized. Uh, it's not been commercialized. I mean, not it, you can literally put that sort of thing together yourself. Cost was turning out to about about eighty dollars. I would say we we are our next versions though. We're changing a number of the sensors. That was like uh, version one point oh. We're already on version three right now, uh, and we're actually if you remember, I had that spectrometer 
that was just slightly bigger than a quarter, we're looking at incorporating that into our um, sensor array. As an industrial hydrogenist, we are accustomed to limits or comparison values. Are there guidance limits for blue light wavelengths? Yes, and that that I that plot I showed you, uh, there's ACA, GIH, TLVs, and I believe I gave you a reference for optical safety. If 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 I did not, um, I'll I will add it for you, Matt, and you can post okay. it. Is there a range of recommended indoor light for general manufacturing that provides the best balance between cost savings and comfort and acceptance by workers. Yeah, so that's more or less what we were showing in that uh, slide where we showed up to 74%. Those were all in the same range of uh, visibly effective lumens or lux, or what they call EVE, uh, equivalent visual effect efficacy. That's the term that's actually in the IES TM24-13 is VEL, visibly effective lumens. Remember, lumens is really about the source. Vis e equivalent visible efficacy is e taking that equation and applying it to the measured lux and the scotopic and photopic ratio. With battery, solar panel, and LED popularity, is it is a win-win for consumer lighting, yes. I, I, I would agree, but what, I, what I'm what i an advocate of is if you're gonna get an LED, we really need to be using dimmable, tunable LEDs in order to really uh, have a win-win. If you're getting a, too much of these, just straight 6,500 Kelvin, or the other one I hate are these LED, uh, blue LED night lights. We, we've seen, there's data out there that like five lux or less for like a minute of high blue uh, could result in, in a measurable decrease in melatonin secretion. So yeah, a couple hours before you go to bed, you, you dim your lights and you make it warmer, more into the orange red, more like 3000 Kelvin or less. Okay, but that you're, you're right though, with the power consumption uh, there and their efficacy so much better, you could, run a lot of these LEDs now off a solar panel. How do you turn, how do you determine if your lighting is in the blue range? Hey, you need a spec well, you can you can the eye at higher light levels at least will be able to tell you blue, yellow, red. That's a visual, but there's large differences in people's ability to discern color and think about it if you have if you have a uh, uh, you're colorblind. So the, the, the proper way is going to be with a, with the spectral power distribution, which you get from a spectrometer. All right, that'll conclude the questions. Dr. Mills, thank you for your presentation. If there are any specific application questions, you can call me at 866-RENT-EHS uh, or 866-736-8347. You can also reach me by email, matt at racorents.com. If you want to know more about the technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. We put a lot of good technical tips on my blog um, and LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, we do record these trading sessions, which will be up on our uh, Rayco Rents YouTube channel. Uh, if there are topics you'd like us to consider, uh, please send me an email with the subject. Uh, we have access to a lot of product and process specialists. Um, please let me know what you should cover and get on it. Um, at this point, if there are no further questions, our presentation will conclude. Thank you for attending.